Okay, so today's lecture is going to be on determination of fetal well-being by Professor Diaz. So first we want to begin with ultrasound. Ultrasound is a procedure that lasts about 20 minutes that uses high-frequency sound waves to visualize internal organs and tissue producing real-time three-dimensional images of the fetus and maternal structures. An early diagnosis of complications, it also permits early intervention and decreased neonatal and maternal morbidity and mortality. So there are three different types of ultrasound. The first one we want to talk about is transabdominal ultrasound. This is safe, it's non-invasive, it's a painless procedure where they use an ultrasound transducer, which is a device that is moved over the abdomen to obtain an image of the patient, um, of the patient's um, fetus in the uterus. And the, usually when they do this uh, procedure in the first trimesters, they ask that the patient have a full bladder to help really visualize the uterus and the fetus. The other ultrasound that can be used is a transvaginal, which is, an, this is a little bit more invasive procedure. It can be uncomfortable for the patient. Um, it, do, it does require them to have to undress from the waist down because a probe will be inserted vaginally to allow for more accurate evaluation. Um, this is usually used for obese patients, especially because um, sometimes when they use a transducer, if they have a large um, abdomen, um, sometimes it's really hard to visualize those um, the fetus image. So the probe actually works a little bit better, especially in the first trimesters. Um, and, it's, and it also it's good to um, detect ectopic pregnancy. It identifies abnormalities and establish gestational age. And it also can be used to, um, if they need to see the cervix, the length of the cervix, especially if a woman may have a shortened cervix or if she's at risk for preterm labor, um, they can identify these things early on. So the indications for um, this, also the transvaginal, is that it also can measure the fetal head, the femur structures determine gestational age, and also diagnose fetal restrictions. It can also determine the amniotic fluids amount, and it can estimate the birth weight, especially um, abnormal large fetus. Um, it could determine if the fetus is macrosomic, which is, fairly, is, which is really large. Um, it also detects uh, if they have too much fluid, which is which we call polyhydramnios. Um, Olyhydramnios is um, when they have too little fluids. And this can also be um, determined through the external um, abdominal ultrasound as well, not just only for the transvaginal. Then you have your Doppler ultrasound, which is more of a blood flow analysis. So this is a non-invasive method to study the maternal fetal blood flow by measuring velocity at which um, the red blood cells travel in the uterine and the fetal blood vessels. And it's useful to detect uh, intrauterine growth restriction, basically when the baby is not growing. And poor, it also can detect poor placental perfusion and high-risk pregnancy, such as hypertension, diabetes, multiple gestation, and preterm labor. Okay, so what are the nursing actions for this? So this basically can, um, you want to prepare the client for the, for the transabdominal ultrasound. You want to explain the procedure. You want to advise to drink one quart of water prior to the, uter um, to the ultrasound. Um, assist the patient in a, if they're in a supine position, you want to make sure that you um, have a wedge under the right hip just so that it doesn't cause um, for them to become faint because you can cause supine hypertension. And that was discussed in our first lecture. Uh, you can apply warm transducer gel to the client's abdomen because the gel can be a little bit cold. And this allows um, for the transducer to move around over the skin to get a better image. You also want to provide a patient a washcloth towel to wipe themselves off after the procedure and allow to use the restroom to empty out the bladder after the procedures. So the nurse will prepare, uh, when she prepares for a transvaginal ultrasound, she again want to assist the client in lithotomy position. And again, um, it, since she's going to be laying on her back, again, it's important to put a wedge. Um, cover the vaginal probe with a protective device such as a condom, and you want to make sure that you um, that they lubricate the probe with the water soluble gel. And of course, you want to inform the patient that she will feel some pressure since it's going to be inserted vaginally, um, and then they're actually going to have to move it around a little bit, so that may make them feel uncomfortable a little bit. 
All right, so let's move on to biophysical profile. So this also uses a real-time ultrasound um, to do this uh, physical, to visualize the physical and physiological characteristics of the fetus and observe for phys biophysical response. This is also in combination with the non-stress test, which we'll talk in the next slides, because they also have to determine the fetal heart rate. So indications for the BPP is if they have a non-reactive, non-stress test, if they're suspected hydramnios or polyhydramnios, meaning if they have too uh, much uh, fluids or little fluids, or if they're suspected of hypopoxemia or hypoxia. So the, presenta the client presentation, it could be a premature rupture of membranes, maternal infection, or decreased fetal movement, which is what we call IUGR. So what we, um, it measures five variables with the score of two for each number finding and zero for each abnormal variable. So there's the five variables that it's assessing is fetal heart rate, and that is determined by the non-stress test. Um, it actually tests for fetal breathing movements. Although babies do not breathe in utero, they still um, use those those that, that diaphragm muscles and they can show in utero that it's moving even though most of the breathing is the oxygen is circulated through the mother and it bypasses the lungs but there is still breathing movements that are taking place um, there's the fetal body movement so you'll be looking at extension and flexion as the baby moves in utero and then looking at the fetal tone, the closure of the hands, are they the extension and return to flexion. And they also measure the amniotic fluid index to make sure that there's a pocket of fluid that measures at, at least two centimeters in two perpendicular planes equaling two. So those are the variables that they assess. Um, so the score should, uh, it, a normal score should be between eight to 10. If it's four to six, it can indicate the abnormal suspects chronic fetal asphyxia, or if it's less than four, it's abnormal or severe fetal, fetal asphyxia. So again, at that point, they would need to intervene um, depending on how far along the mother is based on these results. Okay, so we kind of talked about non-stress tests, so here I'm going to go and explain it a little bit more further because this is this test can be done in conjunction with a BPP or this can just be a standing alone test that they can do. Um, this is a very non-invasive invasive way, non-invasive way to monitor fetal well-being. It assesses for adequate fetal oxygenation. It evaluates the fetal heart rate and responds to fetal movement. And usually they start to introduce this um, towards the end of the second trimester and in the beginning of the third trimester. So indications for a non-stress test, it, it decreased fetal movement. Uh, if the mother ha baby is not growing, which is intrauterine growth restriction, if it's post maturity, so basically it's past its due date, um, if the mother is diabetic, or if they have gestational hypertension, if the mother has a history of fetal demise, meaning that she's had a stillborn or her, or her baby died in utero, um, they would do non stress tests, uh, advanced maternal age. And anytime they have sickle cell disease or isoimmunization, they also do the non-stress test. So basically this procedure is they use uh, two, two devices. They use a Doppler transducer and a tocotransducer. transducer. The Doppler transducer is used to monitor the fetal heart rate. And the tocotransducer transducer is used to monitor uterine contractions that are attached externally to a client's abdomen to a place tracing strips. So in the picture, if you look at it, on the top of the fundus is where the toco transducer to monitor uterine contractions. And the one that's just below it, it and it's kind of slightly to the patient's right side, um, is, where the, is where they assess the fetal heart rate. So sometimes you have to kind for especially for the fetal heart rate because depending on the position of the baby, they'll usually do a Leopold's maneuver, which basically Leopold maneuver uh, identifies um, is by palpation palpating the abdomen. They're able to identify the position of the baby, which is the presentation and the way the fetal lie is, um, to determine where is the best placement to be able to hear the fetal heart rate. 
once they're connected, they're actually connected to the fetal monitor machine, which is on the side, and they actually have a, a strip of paper that actually records the fetal movement, I'm, I'm sorry, records the contractions and records the fetal heart rate. And usually they're on, um, you want to position this patient on in a semi-sitting position, or if she's on, if she's in a bed, again, they need to um, place her uh, in semi-fowlers. Um, they only have to do this for about 20 minutes, and basically um, what they're assessing for is to see reactive results, indicating a healthy status. So in a 20-minute period, they should have two accelerations, which means is that the heart rate will accelerate 15 beats above the fetal heart rate baseline and it's lasting for 16, I'm sorry, 15 seconds. Okay, so it's the 15 by 15 rule that we have. 15 beats per minute above the fetal heart rate for lasting for 15 seconds. Usually babies that are after 32 weeks, you should, that's the findings you should have. If it's less than 32 week baby, um, then the rule is generally that their heart rate will go above the baseline for 10 seconds for lasting for 10 seconds. So it's 10 by 10 rule for less than 32. So the results, you want to see at least two of those accelerations. And if you don't see that, then it's what we call non-reactive. But if you do see the two accelerations in a 20-minute period, then it is reactive which is what we want to see. That is basically indicating that the baby is well oxygenated and it's doing well. Sometimes there would be times where the baby will not have those accelerations. If the, and it could be resulting to sleeping, it could be fetal immaturity or maternal medication or sometimes even nicotine use can cause that. So usually what they do is they will either do an acoustic vibration to stimulate the fetus to wake up um, sometimes they'll have the mom either drink some cold water or drink some juice to help get that baby moving. Although, and sometimes they'll monitor for another 20 minutes. Um, if that's not the case, then that's when they may send the mother to go get uh, either a contraction stress test or a BPP, which is the biophysical profile, which we already talked about. Okay, so let's move on to the contraction stress, stress test. So this um, usually, it can be done by two ways. Um, in your ATI, it mainly focuses on the nipple stimulation, but it also can be done by using um, Pitocin, which is a synthetic drug that provokes contractions. But I'm focusing on ATI, and the ATI um, talks more primarily about nipple stimulation. And so the way that this is done is that the woman lightly brushed their palms of nipples for two minutes, which causes the pituitary gland to release oxytocin to stimulate the uterus to contract. Oxytocin is, um, is a natural hormone that is produced in um, pregnancy and towards the end of pregnancy, especially when you're about to um, deliver. And what oxytocin has two purposes. It actually makes it, um, causes the woman uterus to contract to help in labor to expel the baby. But it also serves a purpose in terms of milk expulsion when the mother is breastfeeding. So usually what happens is that the oxytocin is produced in the uh, pituitary glands and basically it um, allows for, um, for in breastfeeding, once the baby suckles on the breast, it sends a signal and it actually um, has the milk go into the milk ducts and then it actually causes it to release. The oxytocin causes it to release to expel out into nipples so it feeds the baby. So it has a double whammy. Um, so you know for women who um, decide to breastfeed, there it all not only does it help nourish their baby, but then it also helps contract their uterus as well because it also does that. And so it actually helps prevent um, postpartum hemorrhage, and it actually helps the woman's uterus go back to its pre-pregnant state. So it has a lot of purpose. So in this situation, it wants the, it, having them stimulate the breast will actually cause the uterus to contract. And this process is repeated in five minutes. 
And what they're trying to determine is the fetal response to contractions to determine how the fetus will tolerate the stress of labor. And again, the indications for this is that if they have a non-reactive test, NST test, which um, they didn't get the baby to heart rate to accelerate at least two times in that 20 minute window. Um, if, there's, uh, if there's decreased fetal movement or there's intrauterine growth restriction or post-maturity diabetes or gestational hypertension or history of fetal demise or advanced maternal age or sickle cell disease um, will be indications also for this contraction stress test. So the nursing care is obtain and document a baseline of the fetal heart rate. Fetal movements and contractions for 10 to 20 minutes. You want to also have uh, obtain a consent form because um, this can put them at risk for going into labor. So you always want to, when you do an informed consent, you always want to make sure that you let them um, know the risk and the benefits of the procedure and if there's any complications so that they know to make sure that they can make an informed decision of whether they want to do this test or not. Um, when they initiate nipple stipulation, if no contractions, instruct client to roll a nipple between her thumb and fingers or brush her palm across her nipple. The client will stop when the uterine contractions begin. And you want to monitor and provide adequate rest periods to avoid hyperstimulation. So if there was hyperstimulation of the uterus uh, or preterm labor occurs, do the following. Monitor for contraction lasting longer than 90 seconds or occurring more frequently every two minutes. Then administer tocolytic medication, which that helps stop um, the contractions. And then you want to maintain bed rest and observe for 30 minutes afterwards to see the contractions have ceased. So your interpret of findings will be that if it's negative, it is normal. So, you know, we tend to think of negative being bad, but in this case, negative is normal. So three contractions of at least 40 second duration within a 10 minute window and no late decelerations, meaning the drop in fetal heart rate, then that is normal. If it's positive, that means abnormal. So there's a presence of late deceleration after contractions. There may be possible fetal hypoxia, and that may indicate for having the delivery of the baby may be indicated. All right, so let's talk about amniocentesis. This is another test. This is more invasive. This is actually more um, needs to require an uh, informed consent to um, to be have this testing. It is a diagnostic test, so it's not a screening tool. It's a diagnostic test. It's more of a confirmatory test that can be used if a patient if a patient is have had gotten screened for some sort of genetic testing and it came out abnormal. This would be the next procedure to confirm if that was. Um, to confirm it if, if it truly is that definitive if their baby may have a genetic disorder or some sort. They also use it for other reasons and we'll talk about that in the next slide. So basically what this procedure does is an aspiration of the amniotic fluid for analysis by insertion of a needle um, through their belly and they use um, a ultrasound to guide them and direct them to um, the amniotic sac so that they can extract this amniotic fluid. This is usually done between 15 and 20 weeks and again it's an invasive procedure and consent is needed. So again the indications can be for this testing. I did say one of them that if they had an abnormal genetic testing this can be for advanced maternal age over 35. If they had a previous um, child with a chromosomal abnormality they may do it again just to determine if this next child may have it. If during pregnancy they got diagnosed in their screening test of a fetal abnormality, they may want to do this. Um, abnormal maternal serum alpha fetal protein testing, triple quad, triple marker quad screening were abnormal. If they had a previous offspring with neural tube defect, defect, that's why it's important to take your amino acid before pregnancy starts to help prevent that. Um, and also take it during pregnancy as well. Um, both parent carriers, if they have a recessive genetic disorder, they may put the risk at baby of also being um, developing a genetic disorder that may require for them, that may indicate they may um, want to opt for this test. Um, fetal hemolytic disease, if they're having some blood disorder, or it also can be used to determine lung maturity as well.
especially if their mother is going through um, having um, is at risk for preterm labor. So before this procedure, you want to explain the procedure and obtain informed consent. You want to make sure that they empty the bladder prior to procedure to reduce the size and um, prevent puncturing the bladder. And during the procedure, you want to obtain baseline vitals and fetal heart rate prior to procedure. Place in supine position with the wedge underneath the right hip. They will cleanse the abdomen with antiseptic solution. Client educate the client on the procedure as you're going as you're doing the procedure because they may that may make them help them put them at ease because they may have a little bit of anxiety having to go through this procedure. Um, she may feel slight pressure as a needle is inserted, and they continue to and ask them to continue to breathe because holding the breath will lower um, diaphragm. Post procedure, you want to monitor client's vitals their fetal heart rate and uterine contractions before, during, and 30 minutes after the procedure. Uh, for women who are, ha are RH negative, um, we recommend that they must be given Rogram to prevent again uh, against RH isoimmunization. So again, we want to educate the client and to report to the provider if she experienced after the procedure any fever, chills, leakage of fluid, bleeding at insertion site, decreased fetal movement, they have vaginal bleeding or uterine contractions. Um, and also we want to inform them about the potential complications with this testing. It can either cause maternal fetal hemorrhage, amniotic fluid emboli, so it's like a basically a amniotic fluid causing almost like a blood clot. Um, infection, they have, can have RH isoimmunization, abrupto placenta, premature rupture of membranes, or it can potentially cause fetal death. So um, what are the indications once, the, once they have this testing, what are the findings? So alpha -peter protein can be measured from the amniotic fluid to assess for new tube defects or chromosomal disorders. If it's a high level, that can indicate neural tube defects, encephaly, which is an incomplete development of fetal skull and brain, spina bifida, which they have an open spine, or alpha cili, which is abdominal wall defect. If they have low levels, they can indicate Down syndrome or gestational trophoblastic disease. If they opt to do a fetal lung test uh, for this, for the amniocentesis, fetal test lung maturity less than 37 weeks, an event of preterm labor, rupture membranes, or C-section. We'll de they'll determine if there's a need for glucocorticoids to promote lung maturity, which is usually bethamidazone, what they may give. Um, but the results we'll have is this lysinthin phenomyelin, which is the LS ratio, which if it's 2 to 1 ratio indicates lung maturity. If it's 2.51 or 3.3 to uh, 1 for a client who has um, diabetes. Okay, so I kind of mentioned this was the maternal CM alpha fetal protein screening, which assesses the level of fetal protein in the pregnancy woman's serum to detect neural tube defects. The test is done between 16 to 18 weeks. Uh, low levels of AFP can indicate Down syndrome or hydroform mole. So I always think of um, this to make it easier is anything for low, meaning down. Okay, so Down syndrome. Um, high levels of fetal protein can indicate neural tube defects or encephaly or brain to develop abnormalities. So abnormal findings for the testing um, with this one, if they decide that um, since this is a screening tool, this is where that amniocentesis comes into play. If they wish to do that, they can do a triple marker quad screening or have genetic counseling or have a ultrasound done. Okay, so we had a quad marker screening, which is a blood test that ascertains information about fetal birth defects. It is test for the following. So it has three things that, um, components that it tests. It tests the human chorionic gonotropin, which is the HCG, which is produced by the placenta. Um, that's kind of the hormone that detects that you're pregnant. You have the alpha fetal protein, which is produced by the fetus, which that can it's tell you if it's um, if they have Down syndrome or neurotube defects. 
Estriol is a protein produced by the fetus in the placenta, and then you have inhibin A, which is a uh, protein produced by the ovaries and placenta. And again, the indications is for risk for genetic chromosomal abnormalities. So low levels will be Down syndrome, and again, high levels will indicate neural tube defects. Then you have what we call your fetal kick count, which um, we tend to have a lot of moms do this uh, be, you know, in their, um, later in the trimester, but usually women will start to feel uh, fetal movement by 16 to 20 weeks, so this is kind of in their second trimester. And um, when they start feeling uh, the baby movements, initially they'll probably feel like a fluttering feeling, which is what we call quickening. Um, and then eventually they'll start to feel, as the baby starts to grow, they'll start to feel the baby start to kick and move a lot more. Um, but usually when we tell them to uh, do fetal kick count, we have them sit or lie down on their left side and count the fetal kicks. And usually we tell them, we recommend that to pick a time when their baby is most active. And they want to do these fetal movements to record it. And so they basically put a keep a record just on a sheet just to make sure that the baby's moving every day once they start to feel the baby move. Because um, again, it just assesses fetal well-being. It just makes sure that you know there, there's some something's moving in there and that they know that things are going that it, they can at least feel the baby. Um, Usually, if they're feeling uh, fewer than three kicks within an hour or fewer than 10 kicks in 12 hours, they need further evaluation. So we need to find out what's going on, why is that baby not moving. Um, usually, if they have no fetal movement, it, you know, it could be potential that the baby's in distress or something's going on. So we really want to have um, patients come in and get evaluated right away when they um, don't feel those baby fetal movements or just not as usual, like they're that is not their norm. All right, the last thing we'll talk about is amniotic fluid volume. The amniotic fluid volume, basically the ultrasound scan measures amniotic fluid pockets in all four quadrants surrounding the mother umbilicus and produces an amniotic fluid index. Um, so basically, the findings are that they have to measure within five to 19 centimeters. It's considered normal. Less than five centimeters known as oligohydram which is insufficient amniotic fluid associated with growth restriction and fetal distress. If it's over 30 centimeters, is polyhydromios, which is excessive amniotic fluid, and is associated with neural tube defects, GI obstruction, and fetal high drops. So basically what fetal high drops uh, fatalis is, is a severe life-threatening problem with severe swelling in the fetus and newborn, and it's also called high drops. Okay, so this concludes this lecture. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Thank you.